Hello and welcome to Voice of Aroha Wellington Access Radio 106.1 FM. Don't forget to check us out on social media. My name is Aarti and today I'm here with Kodrian and Rem, my co-hosts. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm so excited for this choreo that we're going to have today. Definitely, I'm more than excited and um, yes, you know, very shortly we know who we have in the studio. But yeah, I'm very excited and thank you guys for co-hosting this together. Today we are here with Ihaya and we're very excited to have you here today. Could you please tell us a bit about yourself? Uh, as you said, my name is Ihaya uh, Pukatapu. Um, from the local iwi in Wellington in Hutt Valley, uh, which is Te Ati Awa. Um, <laughs> and you sort of have a background in uh, resource management and um, you yeah, do a little bit of um, teaching environmental studies. Cool. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, thanks for telling us a bit about yourself. Um, our next question would just be, what inspired you to pursue your current um, passion? Uh, well, growing up in the suburban area of Hutt Valley, um, when I was um, a child in the 80s, um, going through to my teenage and adult, young adult years in the 90s, um, witnessed a lot of environmental changes uh, with our forests and our waterways, um, negative changes. Um, so I was, you know, and then, you know, reading about, at that time, reading about um, the climate change effects that the scientists were talking about then mm -hmm. and how they were going to, they were almost like prophets talking about mm -hmm. the future that was in store for us and, and now that's exactly what, what's happened, what we're seeing now um, with climate change effects. So um, I've always been interested in... Um, uh, being involved with how to um, how to respond to those those changes. How is the environment significant to you? How, what connection do you have with it? Oh, so our, our our people believe, um, and it's not unlike other cultures from around the world that you're part of the earth. Um, we have a word, um, which means. Loosely it means uh, genealogy, but it, it literally means to be of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another phrase that we identify ourselves with, and is, um, the phrase is tangata whenua, which means people of the land. Mm -hmm. And so um, we've been the indigenous people. Um, more often than not, we're not really listened to um, by uh, the mainstream population. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of um, battles with uh, industrialization and capitalism um, because we've seen a lot of the changes to, to our waterways, our fresh waterways and our coastal waterways um, and our forests and our lands. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's been... Uh, quite a tough battle for us, mm. um, especially Māori that are living in the city, um, but even a lot of our people that live in the rural areas, whether it's on farmland or in uh, our native forests, uh, there's been quite a quite a, a battle there to try and maintain uh, the, in, the integrity yeah. of the environment. Um, so, yeah, um, we're still, still trying to... Um, advocate on behalf of the environment mm. um, for for everyone who, who chooses New Zealand as their home. Mm. Mm. So like from everything that you guys are doing so far, um, would you say you have seen much improvements since you started? Well, no, no, is, is the short answer to that. Um, it's, it's gotten worse. It's gotten worse. Uh, when I was a young person in the 80s, there were many rivers that you could... Uh, swimming without any um, health effects, but 80% mm. uh, of our country's rivers now um, are polluted. They're not mm. safe to swim in. Mm. Um, and we have a basic standard um, that indicates whether or not a fresh waterway is, is uh, healthy or not, and that's if you can drink out of it. 
um, then it's good. But most of our rivers, if you if you drink out of it, you will, you will end up in hospital. Um, <laughs> in Poi family. Yeah. yeah. So we um, we we've listened to a lot of our old people that have passed on, heard stories of how the land and the and the waterways were when they were young, yep. mm. and and sometimes that might mean literally like eighty to a hundred years ago. Um, and now that I'm middle aged. Um, I'm 49 now, so we we have some real fears for our future generations and how they're going to be affected by yeah. um, pollution of our of our land and, and waterways mm-hmm. and and all the um, native flora and fauna um, that we call our kin um, with temperature water um, rise waters rising on the coastal area. Uh, a lot of our seafood will be impacted on. Um, we've already lost um, a lot of our food resources from our fresh waterways, um, and our forests uh, are still under attack by by pests like the Australian possum and when pigs and deer, um, which which many New Zealanders hunt sometimes. Um, if they're not kept in check, they can they can destroy a forest. Um, then there's rats affecting our, our native birds. Um, so there's, and then there's invasive weeds um, mm. that have been brought over to, to Aotearoa. So um, quite overwhelmed mm-hmm. with the changes that are happening now. Um, there's not a, well, the government says this, there's not a lot of money to go around and that's probably true. Mm. Um, we are a small economy um, compared to the rest of the world with a lot of land. Um, and I suppose one of the problems is is our main exports out of the country, uh, you know, meat and, and dairy, mm. um, but they're also part of the problem in terms of the pollution that goes into our waterways. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a culture clash. It's actually bad economics mm. to grow meat and milk um, turn, to turn grass yeah. into meat yeah. and to turn grass into milk because on the same plot of land where these animals are grazing, you can grow far more vegetables and other food um, that's probably actually more healthy for you. Um, just before we came in, we talked about yeah. um, the multitude of feral goats that are running wild yeah. uh, in, the, in the native bush areas and they, you know, um, that one animal goat that's an amazing animal, eh? you know, it can browse, yeah. Mm-hmm. It can chew up, but if they were farmed um, uh, out of the forest and sort of kept um, in a way that other cultures know in terms of the knowledge of, of how mm-hmm. to look after goats and how to get the best out of them, they'd probably be better than cows. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand goat's milk is, is a lot healthier than cow's milk. It's a smaller animal to manage. Um, they don't pollute the waterways in the same way that cows do. Um, I think most people might be shocked to hear that we have we have five million dairy cows mm. and five million beef cattle. You know, yeah. that, that's 10 million beasts, <laughs> um, which is nearly twice the population of humans. Um, so, you know, New Zealand's one big massive farm um, and I think we need to change the way uh, we have our farming practices. Um, there's a lot of um, ancient crops like industrial hemp that is very much known to the old world yep. yeah. they, they could do wonders in this country um, instead of pine like there's a lot of pine trees here and as we've seen with Cyclone Gabriel a lot of the slash that sort of just um, got carried down from the hills through the rivers and then yeah. just dumped all over the place yeah. um, you'd never experience that if, if, if they were replaced with industrial hemp Mm. Um, and just just to say hemp is not marijuana, you <laughs> you, you can't smoke it. Yeah. Um, well, you can, but you'll just get a headache. <laughs> yeah, well, that's awesome. Quite a lot. You mentioned something. It is uh, oh, it's true about you know other cultures. They they use how to take care about these animals. But what will be your perspective or comment on this? That now we are living in a world people encouraging more to be vegetarians or vegan. While some cultures, it is kind of inhibited and the culture that meat is a kind of uh, uh, generosity of, of welcoming a guest because if a guest uh, come, 
we need to have kind of a lot of fries, a lot of meat to be put on the table to to welcome, showing them like you're welcome to my culture. Mm. But would you think that we can tackle this issue of people who are saying there's a lot of waste from animals and a lot of pollution by what we're talking about, let's say if you have a god that could be, look, we can make a yugo, we can make a cheese and all mm. these products. And guess what? It's all natural products. Mm. We don't need to use plastics. That's right. You know, you just use the things in the home and that could also limit the factories production. What do you think about this solution? Oh, I think we could learn a great deal from um, immigrant communities that have come to New Zealand uh, in terms of their culture and the values that they can bring here. Mm. Um, that's why I talked about the yeah, goat because right. there mm. are literally hundreds of thousands if not millions of feral goats running wild in the bush mm -hmm. and that's a, a kind of a sign that um, you know New Zealanders don't value that one animal the same way other cultures do mm -hmm. um, I think that um, if we look at our ancestors uh, in pre-European mm -hmm. times we were mainly pescatarian so it's fish mm -hmm. and vegetables mm -hmm. And when I was a kid in the 1980s, um, fish was a poor man's food. Mm. Um, now, it's far more expensive mm -hmm. than red yeah. meat. Um, right. And, and it, you know, we've got microplastics and stuff like that affecting the fish. But, I mean, um, when I say there's a lot we could learn off the immigrant communities, that's, to me, that's a sign that um, New Zealand is still a, a young country. Yeah like a baby of the global community. You know, we've only been, even our people, we've only been here a thousand years. Whereas, you know, your people, for example, are so, so <laughs> much <laughs> more ancient. Celebrated on the 1st of April, 6,773. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we've got a lot to learn mm. from from other cultures that are coming here and calling this, this place home. That's beautiful, but also, um, oh, sorry, Tim will ask for more. Because you guys are indigenous people of this land, and, and then the people who are indigenous in the land, they had the practices and traditions, or the tikana they have used. So what kind of things you think in a Maori world that have used in a place of protecting their environment? And it'd be achievable, transferable in the modern world if we can. Well, it, it's, it's changed so much. Uh, it's hard for us to uh, understand how our ancestors live. So, for example, there's eighty percent of the country has has had its native forest cut down, mm -hmm. and traditionally we depended a lot on our native forests. Um, our style of agriculture was about about plot rotation rather than crop rotation. Mm -hmm. So, in the forests, there would be small garden plots, and then a forest track 2k away to another small forest plot, mm. maybe one or two acres. So rather than cut down the entire forest and then turn it all into pasture, you just have pockets of agriculture in the forest. And when I say plot rotation, what that means is um, some plots would be would, would have um, food grown there for three, three years. Mm. And then after that three years, it'll be left for three years fallow mm -hmm. and then you'd go to another plot that has been left for three years fallow and then you'd you'd grow food there for three years mm -hmm. so that was a, and then you know the type of fertilizers we would use would be ash uh, seaweed um, fine sand mm -hmm. um, and, and and then the change came when the forest were clear felled and then you know artificial fertilizer started to be used where you where it was um, the system became crop rotation on the same block of land forever and ever and ever. You got to put a whole lot of different fertilizers, and in modern times, that meant you know mining phosphates mm -hmm. um, to to be able to put all this fertilization mm -hmm. fertilizers into the land. And you know the, the world now has a problem where we've basically mined um, the majority of the world's topsoil. Mm -hmm. So I think um, there's. Uh, great value in learning from um, other cultures. Um, but I think one of the ways that we could learn some of these more ancient techniques of um, 
being stewards of the land is simply to have different different ethnic groups have uh, having the opportunity to create um, their villages and their cultures in mm. on vacant lands in the rural area because we have a lot of land mm. we have a lot of land in this country and there's different blocks of land that you could buy maybe five six seven hectares for four hundred thousand dollars five hundred thousand dollars so if you have incoming um, immigrants from other country I think there's the government should allow and, and give them the opportunity to build um, a, a, a Syrian village yeah. mm. or an Iranian village mm. where um, they can express their culture there rather than being assimilated yeah. um, completely into mm. New Zealand culture um, and, and, and show us how through their value system we could look after the land and have a different way of expressing food security mm. um, and, and learn off one another. You know, if you go mm. to most countries, um, and especially in the cities maybe, you'll find a Chinatown yeah. in San Francisco yeah. right. or, or New York or California, anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere you go. Um, there was a small Chinatown here in Wellington one time. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, there was a bit of racism that sort of mm. undermined that. But there's, there's no... Uh, reason why we can't have a, a little India, a little mm. Greece, mm. a little Italy, like mm. other countries that have that, and that'll bring greater diversity within within mm. Aotearoa. Yeah. I really love what you said about how we can learn from different cultures and how mm. they're all some way intertwined with each other and how we can actually learn off each other. I think that was really great. Um, what you said, could you tell us a bit more about how the tangata whenua are actually impacted by climate change and how is it impacting them and affecting them? Uh, if we could use the East Coast as an example, uh, a lot of the marae communities, not all of them, but many of them are close to the coastline, um, close to rivers. Um, and so they're now experiencing uh, climate change events that they probably didn't experience 50, 60, 70 years mm, ago, yep. um, you know, where they're getting washed out or, you know, being so close to the sea, eventually with sea level rises, they're going to have to move. Mm. Um, and there's no guarantee that um, they can have access to or even have other blocks of Māori land where mm. they can move to, to higher ground. Mm. Um, that's going to be a huge huge problem for a lot of the, the tribes. So there's roughly 900 marae around the country and I'd say 90% of them are in a, in a rural mm -hmm. area. Um, luckily for some of them, they're, they're on high ground, they're high up mm -hmm. inland, um, they're close to a water source that may not be a river that's going to flood all the time. Um, in pre-European days, um, a lot of the tribes would live on hilltop forts. Yep. So when you in Auckland City, you can still see a lot of the the old past sites mm. with their hilltop forts. Um, and so it may mean that um, a lot of the rural areas who are down on the coast might have to re reoccupy a lot of old um, mm. hill forts that we call them pa. Um, there are some here in Wellington that are on high ground. They're, they're probably um, s quite small um, compared to some of the Māori communities that are um, present today that are still traditional villages. Um, but, I mean, that's a, that's a side of Aotearoa New Zealand that even 5th, um, 6th, 7th generation New Zealanders don't yeah. know too much about. Mm. Um, the most you might see is an AA sign on the side of a state highway that yeah. says, you know, um, Kuha Marae. Yeah. And, and that, that's all they'll see because, you know, it's usually a metal road. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not much known about it. Um, but a lot of those communities, um, you know, they don't want the road to be tar sealed to make it easier for people to get there or they don't want a whole lot of tourism because mm -hmm. that means consumption mm -hmm. um, coming into their area. Um, you know, waste problems in terms of rubbish. Um, a lot of the rural communities have a very small carbon footprint as opposed to um, 
city Māori like myself, mm-hmm. who just have, who have a carbon problem just mm-hmm. like just like every other people who live in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, you can try and recycle, yeah. um, but even that that seems to be a problem now. A lot of our mm-hmm. plastic would be taken offshore to China, mm-hmm. and they're not they're mm-hmm. not taking our plastic anyway anymore. And, yeah. and nor should they, nor should they. Yeah. Um, that should be our problem to try and fix. Um, so there are so many issues. Um, that need problem solving, mm. um, but I think that's another thing um, that incoming cultures can also help with too. Um, mm. The resilient cultures mm. um, had a longer experience as a culture um, coming from you know the motherlands that they've come from, um, and and so I think more appreciative of. Of what New Zealand has, and yeah. turn. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of Kiwis yeah. um, that don't realise they have it pretty good here. Yeah. Um, and compared to a lot of incoming cultures, quite lazy, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So we have a lot of issues um, uh, internally um, that we are yet to address. Um, the average New Zealander actually produces more waste than. The, the average American. Oh, we own more mm-hmm. cars per capita than Americans. Um, and our, our emissions targets uh, are not doing very well. Our, our, our emissions are actually growing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're, not do, we're not being very responsible citizens at the moment um, as a collective, but within New Zealand there are some groups that know how to, um, how to I suppose, behave better with the environment mm. than, than the general population. Mm. Then like you were saying, you know, like there's a lot of um, issues with like, for example, like where the marais are and things like that, right? Um, as well as like a lot of problem solving things to do. I What are you currently doing to solve those, like to take the steps, like um, even in terms of like sp- spreading more awareness about um, the dangers and the difficulties that you're facing? Um, is there anything you guys are currently doing? Oh, well, there's a lot of advocacy roles that we play. Um, in the past, like early when I said we've had it hard, um, in our experience we've, we've been to the Environment Court uh, to try and take on uh, industrial companies. We always lose. We always lose. Um, so it's, hard, it's a hard road. Um, we're now um, looking at... Um, proposed changes in legislation yep. on how to manage water. Mm-hmm. And the Labour government under Jacinda Ardern had signalled that there would be uh, co-governance between Māori and, and the Crown. Mm-hmm. And now we're getting a bit worried because there have been signs that maybe the government might backtrack on that. Um, and that's a huge worry for us. Uh there's um, different sort of levels of um, economic strength among the tribes. So, for example, in Ngaitahu, yep. down the South Island, quite powerful economically, um, but even they seem to get sidelined from local councils and the government in terms of um, having more of a say and an authority over how the water is managed in the South Island. Um, And basically what we're up against are the farming community um, whose main catch cry is that, you know, we are the backbone of the economy and so we need more water for to feed our animals um, and and you need us to make the economy strong. But the catch-22 to that or, or the double-edged sword is that what comes with that so-called backbone of the economy is, is a lot of problems mm-hmm. with our emissions, um, the pollution of our waterways and part of their um, catch cry also is that, you know, but there's a lot of pollution in the urban areas, which is, which is true. Mm-hmm. Um, but then what they're arguing is that they're the backbone of the economy because 80% mm. of our primary produce, you know, meat and milk and that is, is exported mm. overseas. Mm. So 
uh, in a way, what they're saying is, you know, we're a big farm to feed um, other countries, mm-hmm. but really the, the food that we're sending over sees only caters for niche markets. Mm. You know, we're not feeding a whole country yeah. and, and saving them from starvation. You know, we might send away a lot of beef, but we also import beef yeah. from Canada, yeah. which seems funny. <laughs> um, you know, one of, one of our um, ancient food resources was the local longfin eel, yeah. which used to be plentiful in this country. Um, and it's now officially on the endangered species list but there's still a commercial quota for it. So that is basically managed extinction. Um, Can't understand that. There's a lot of lobby groups around the country uh, who are calling on um, MPI, um, Ministry of Primary Industries, to to put a moratorium on commercial eeling. Um, And, you know, those eels that are commercially caught are sent to places like England, Mm. uh, Japan, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of eels in the Netherlands, but somehow, you know, they pay a premium for our our product because um, it's seen as, New Zealand's seen as being clean and green and 100% pure, which is just a marketing ploy, to be honest. (laughs) Um, We could could show them plenty of rivers where it's not clean and green at all. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) Welcome back to Voice of Araha. Um, we're just going to do a quick fire round of questions. Um, so, Aati. Okay. So, I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions and just answer as fast as you can. Not too much thinking. <laughs> okay. Car or bike? Bike. Electric car or electric bike? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Why that? Because uh, there's, um, there's embedded carbon uh, in the creation uh, of so when you said bike the first time I meant push bike yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. See, but it still has embedded carbon yeah. but you know there's issues with, with batteries for electric mm. vehicles and stuff okay. yeah. right. urban or rural rural summer or winter summer beach or mountain Oof. <laughs> <laughs> beach morning bird or night owl night owl road trip or plane ride Road trip. Hot chocolate or coffee? Hot chocolate. Dogs or cats? Dogs. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that. Um, one of the questions that we want to just ask you is, what does an ideal world look like to you in terms of climate change? Uh, an ideal world for me is um, the human species trying to find a way to have zero population growth. Yeah. So zero population Mm -hmm. growth doesn't mean we stop having children. Mm. It just means for every person that passes over to uh, the the, the afterlife, Mm -hmm. one person is born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because part of the problem with climate change and resource depletion is uh, exponential population growth. Mm -hmm. And I have to confess our people, I think, have... Uh, from the last time I've seen the statistics, have the highest population rate um, yep. of all the cultures in, in New Zealand. Um, we're quite a young population, um, but I have, a, I have a ton of nieces and nephews who are teenagers who have one or two or three children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm one of seven. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, one of five. <laughs> yeah. and, and so my, my, both of my parents are still alive. Mm-hmm. Um, there's us seven children, uh, I think it's 35 grandchildren, and then I think now maybe 18 or 20 great-grandchildren, <laughs> and, and we're all still alive. And that's mm-hmm. great. And, and not, well it is, <laughs> if, if, you, if you had another planet to, to, to yeah. move to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I have to confess <laughs> that even our people... Um, have a high population rate, yeah. but I think an ideal world is where the whole world mm-hmm. can find a solution or a formula, which will be extremely hard to do, mm-hmm. where 
we have zero population growth. Um, and if we put that at a micro level, if you say you had a five bedroom house and you had 10 people living in it, and then in five years time you had 20 people living in it, yeah. there will be stress mm -hmm. in the house mm -hmm. and there'll be um, less resources yeah. for that house. Um, but I think that is a problem that is uh, a, a global problem. Yeah. And um, that's mostly been um, brought about by the use of oil at the turn of the last century. So from 10,000 years of known human history, um, starting from 1900 backwards, mm -hmm. It took us 10,000 years to grow a global population of 1.5 mm. billion and then we became, began using oil. Mm. And then within 60 years, mm. we yeah. doubled that That's to right. 3 billion. Wow. Doubled it. And then from 1960 to 1990, in 30 years, we doubled that again to yeah. 6 billion. Mm. Mm. And so that's an exponential growth within a century. Where, whereas, you know, it, as I say, it took us 10,000 years to grow a global population just mm. to 1.5 billion. Mm. So, you know, we're all, we're all at fault there. <laughs> yeah. The whole world is at yeah. fault there. And so that, for me, that's what an ideal world is, is when we can achieve zero population growth. Yeah. Thank wow. you for sharing that with us. Um, could you give our listeners and viewers a piece of advice on how they can make a difference? especially in regards to climate change? Um, I think we need to um, reduce the numbers of people living in the cities. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, cities become unsustainable. Yep. Um, and I think it's much better if we had more small villages around, spread out around the country. Um, you know, we can see the stresses that um, Auckland has um, and the other cities, but more mm. so Auckland mm. because there's 1.5 yeah. million people there. Mm. Um, they have um, unique a unique set of problems uh, because of that population. A lot of the taxpayer money has, has to go to Auckland yeah. to try and help their problems, whether it's roading or public transport or water mm. uh, or a whole host of... Um, issues with their infrastructure. Um, so if we could potentially um, have government policies that encourage people to, um, as I was talking about before, build small communities yeah. in the rural areas mm -hmm. um, to give it diversity, um, to also help change the way uh, we manage our land and our waterways, uh, I think um, the country will be better for it. Yeah. Um, because the stress that a city can put on the land and the waterways and its own people mm. um, seems to only get worse. I, I really feel for the mega cities of the Northern Hemisphere, yeah. um, they have a really uncertain future. Yeah. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I don't know how New York is gonna carry on yeah. being New York or how Tokyo is gonna carry on being Tokyo um, we've seen many ancient cities collapse through overpopulation and climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's um, an example and an experience that we need to um, take heed of if we're going to successfully adapt mm -hmm. to the climate change that's happening right now. And that is going to get worse. Yeah. Uh, people like to say we've got to save the planet. The planet's fine. The planet's fine. The environment's fine. Um, there was a time, a long time ago, when the oceans were boiling sulfuric acid. You know, and there weren't many people. Um, so for us to think that um, we need to save the planet, we actually need to save ourselves. Yeah. Love it. I think that's an interesting perspective, I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, I feel very inspired and that was a really insightful chat. So thank you for that. Um, did you guys have any final questions? No, oh, we have to save ourselves. <laughs> save ourselves. Yeah, thank you. Give ourselves an uppercut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so much.